Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today, we are going to be talking about organizing for creative people. And we have Sheila Chandra here to talk about how to channel the chaos of creativity into career success. So welcome, Sheila. Hi. <laughs> Lovely to be here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very excited about this book because um, I have a dear, dear friend who is an artist. And um, I'm a coach like yourself. And there are certain areas that, as a coach, I really don't know how to coach her because I'm also I'm I'm creative, but I'm not the an artist like she is. And mm -hmm. so I have so many questions to ask you on her behalf, um, sure. and the behalf of everyone out there who may be a writer or a painter or, or a sculptist actor. or actor. Yeah. There's so many different what, creative expressions where I think the kind of dilemmas that you have written in your book are encountered all the time. So I wanted to talk about first about you and um, you were uh, an award-winning singer. You are now a coach. You um, discovered and found Styx, who is a, a, a graffiti artist. Is that right? Is that? Yeah, Styx is, um, I mean, if you know much about street art, he's uh, the, the, the centers for street art are um, uh, you know, the, the main center is in the East End of London, and that's really loaded. And uh, he is one of the best known, most collectible uh, street artists in the world. Uh, he's from Hackney, which is East London. And uh, when I met him, he had not had an exhibition other than one group show, and he was homeless. Mm. So I entered him from the chaos of homelessness to international success. It took about five years. Um, and on the way, I wrote a 16,000 word booklet for him to kind of use as a guide mm -hmm. because I was you know, seeing him only every couple of months socially. And uh, uh, he eventually so after he was successful, he nagged me and nagged me and said, you must turn this into a book. So that's the that's the book that's got, um, you know, expanded and, and turned into a sort of full full guide for, for your creative people. And it's about the infrastructure you need as a, to set up as an artist, because, you know, at, at art college, you don't get taught that stuff. You get taught your discipline, which is also obviously the core of what you do and very, very important. But how to set up a business, what kind of infrastructure you'll need, uh, the kind of business culture of the arts, which is not something everybody has automatic access to. I mean, fine, if your grandmother was a painter or your your uncle was is a is a novelist then maybe you have some kind of insight into that specific world um, but if you're um, poor and working class you don't have much access to that kind of thing you don't have access to to the to arts networks then you know I felt it was important uh, to kind of support people in that so there's, there's a lot about culture of the arts there's also a lot about um, how to you know, handle dilemmas like when people ask you to work for free, which they're going to ask you a lot, you know, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and basically how you catalogue your work um, right up to, you know, what happens when you when you pass away and you leave a body of, of copyrighted works? What 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 happens mm. to them? How do you prepare for that? You know, so it's right from the beginning, right from the beginning of your career, if you just left art college, it tries to cover all the basic infrastructure you will need. Of course, it's not specific to a genre because then it would have to be 10 volumes long. But um, it, do, it does give you that in generic terms. It gives you the basic infrastructure. Right. And we got, a, we got an, a question from the listener. Is it for, so it's for any kind of creative person. I mean, yes. even it could be like for me, I'm actually creating this radio show. So I'm a creative person. Maybe not, I don't yeah. paint or anything. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, you talk about the business culture of the arts. What did you mean by that? Uh, I mean that things like... Uh, Concepts around copyright and finances are very different uh, in the arts. Funding it. is very different in the arts. Um, you know, uh, knowing how to ask for, uh, how to find out about those sorts of concepts within your genre. Okay. How, how people get paid, when they expect to get paid, how much of a percentage they typically expect to get paid, you know, all that sort of stuff. Uh, again, I can't be specific to every single genre, but what I what I do is I talk about in one chapter of the book, I talk about the kind of team you should be assembling around yourself. It doesn't have to be a paid for team, but, you know, every creative person needs a support network, at least of supportive peers who can pass on information and talk you through new situations 
ideally a mentor if you can find if you have access to one. how to approach that mentor how to make the most of their time how to get them to take you seriously all that sort of stuff is is in there but you know kind of touching base with all the kinds of support that you will need it's all out, outlined in there and the book is hopefully quite dyslexic friendly because i know a lot of visual artists are dyslexic mm. so we deliberately left lots of white space um used a font that's dyslexic friendly mm. uh the book is i don't know if you noticed but it's all um really short chunks of text yes. i really subhead. appreciated that yeah, it's like, so, well, she's, it's, yeah, it's minimalistic. So like how to save time. It's not like a chapter. It's, it's little bullets and nothing was bigger than these kind of short kind of paragraphs, which makes it easy to read. Because in fact, I, I'd, I'd emailed you and said, you know what, I don't, I, I, I have, I have like two hours in the morning to read this. So I don't know if I can read it, but in 40 minutes, I had gone through a good portion of the book and felt, you know, of course, I'd have to go back and refer to things in more detail, but I had a good sense of where everything was because, like you said, it is encyclopedic, so it's more figuring out what's in here and knowing that it has a resource that I can go back in and find yes. when I had that particular problem. It's so. Yeah. yeah, so, so it's really something that's on your desk. And the publisher is very good about it. They made it, uh, you know, it's a kind of, um, it's it's more than a, hot, a paperback. And so it's got that kind of uh, tough exterior that means you can carry it about in your yes. bag and refer to it when you need. Yes. Okay, I'm going to catch upon some of the things that um, you even just mentioned. So uh, mm -hmm. one is... Um, the team of people that you said that you need to assemble because as I, I told you that a girlfriend of mine is an artist and she's I need help I need you know some she, in, in her case she needed an accountant she needs a business person she needs a salesperson or sort of an agent to actually rep her work she needs to be doing the work herself she feels like she has to do promotion so you have yeah. the roles of you know five different people that she's trying to fulfill herself and that in fact, she needs all the things. She needs to get a sense of her numbers in the accounting. She needs to have someone to sell and rep her work. She needs to be able to promote her work, and she needs to do her work. So, you know, how how have you been able to um, – you said that, you know, whether it's a team that you pay or not or peers or not, um, tell me a little bit about how people create the team of people to support them because she was thinking about doing a mastermind group, which you mentioned – and it was very, very expensive. I think it was like 10 grand. And I said, wow, that's a lot of money. Like you could buy a lot of sales help. So yeah, you know, should you uh, spend I it or not? She's like, should I spend it? I'm like, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't thinking of a, of a paid one. I was thinking mm. you could set one up yourself. Uh, so let's say you're an artist, you're a visual artist. Your, your friend's a visual artist, I yes. take it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um <clears throat> Presumably, she's going to go to uh, lots of gallery openings. She's going to know lots of people at her level and hopefully above. Um, you know, invite them out to lunch, pick their brains. It's very flattering to be asked your expert opinion. And plenty of people are generous enough to be able to give you the kind of insight and knowledge that someone gave them 10 years ago. Um, you know, there are lots of lovely people like that. But even if it's a peer, um, often, you know, they may understand a certain part of the business that you don't. They may understand how to approach gallerists, uh, gallery owners, uh, you know, uh, much more personably. They may have good contacts that are not suitable for them, but are suitable for you. Um, you know, they may have ideas of people at, I don't know, charities. You can run sort of charity uh, uh, events and auctions around your work. Um, so, you know, mine, that network of contacts, it's very much a, a people business, especially if you don't have the money to pay for uh, hired help. Right. Um, so start there. I mean, even if you do have the money to pay for hired help, I think that's uh, you know, you'd be missing a trick if you if you didn't mind that network. I also think it's a great culture to kind of encourage because um, in a lot of genres, unfortunately, we've had this notion of competition. You know, everybody's cutthroat against, you know, all competing for the same uh limited number of opportunities actually the arts are getting harder and harder you know the arts are being devalued they're being defunded in in many different ways uh you know probably differently in the uk than they are in uh in in the us but um it, it seems to be a global trend and i think this is a time when we really could do with pulling together as artists right. because we understand each other's uh dilemmas 
Mm. Well, I have uh, a I have a book writing group that I'm part of, and I can tell you that it's it because I just want to write. I don't know why I was fed, I was led intuitively to write. So even though I don't feel like I'm a good writer, I write anyways. And mm -hmm. so I have this group of five or six people. One who is a professional writer, and this is a way for her to supplement her writing income with actually kind of a recurring income. And, yeah. uh, and it's very nice to actually hear different writing styles, hear about different problems that people are tackling. So, you know, how do I actually, how do I actually play with words as an art form? I, I wasn't even thinking of that, but now that he's brought in that idea, or how do I actually create the narrative arc, you know, just concepts that different people were playing around with different creative, ex different parts of creative expression. And it's mm -hmm. very helpful to actually sit in a group talking about their struggles and as a group kind of coming up to answer so i think that that would be kind of a mind what are those things uh those uh mastermind group that you get a group of artists together yeah um, absolutely. and and basically and it doesn't even have to probably even be the same art but i think there could even be a possibility of having you know a writer or an artist you know different types of people and the benefit of just hearing different ways of do, of thinking through a problem um, so then you, I want to go back to some of the um, other ideas that you mentioned. Um, so, you know, all these things cost money. And one of the hardest things as an artist is to know when you should spend the money. So some of, and the time. So you had mentioned events and auctions. And um, my, my friend who is an artist, she does silk art. So she, because it's on a fabric, she could do a painting. She could do uh -huh. pillows. Uh, she can do wearable art so she's played around with all of these different things and every single one of these mediums has has a channel of marketing so you know for her for her wearable art and scarf you know it's about shows and buying shows in new york and you know doing auction and events and going in and knocking on a lot of doors to get distributed um same kind of activity for the uh, home, home, you know, the pillows and home accessories. So, you know, how does one decide? Because it's not cheap. Like to go to these events costs time and money and energy. So I think one of her events was like five grand, you know, so three to five wow. grand to have a table where you may not sell three to five grand worth of stuff, but you may find one or two contacts. Like, so how do you make those trade offs? Do you have what do you advise your clients? Because I'm sure they have similar kinds of dilemmas. Uh, well, it's, of course, it's very difficult and it's a very individual uh, situation. Something that I do uh, encourage people, especially at the beginning to do, is to find a brand because as much as we, as I, I mean, of course, we don't like being categorized. We are not right. sheep. I mean, right. the whole point of artists is that we, we like to live outside the box. And then we are... Uh, entering a commercial marketplace if we're hoping to make money from our art. So there's a potential clash of cultures there. Um, and of course, we're not a can of beans, but um, you need an arrowhead to get through. Mm -hmm. And that arrowhead is the kind of, you know, as a writer, you'll have heard this phrase, the log line. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't so, heard it, so tell me what it is, because I don't know what a log, log line, line is. is. If you're trying to sell a screenplay, um, then... Uh, Oh, I think you call an elevator pitch here. It's an elevator yeah, pitch. Yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's one sentence. So I, I believe tagline. Jaws. Yeah, yeah tagline. Jaws, uh, Jaws was sold as uh, Moby Dick in the 21st century. Ah, okay, got it. Okay, got it. So it kind of gives you this enticing flavor of what you do. Um, so in a sense, as, as a, a brand, that's uh, also what we need. So, um, you know, what is the whisper about you? If, you, if your clients, if one of your if one of your customers is going to um, uh, recommend you to another and you do six things, it's going to be very difficult for them to remember. Mm -hmm. um, when I first met Stick, for instance, uh, and I'm using him because I'm allowed to, obviously, confidentiality with my other clients. But right. with him, I, I'm, al I'm allowed right. to tell some of these stories. I have permission. But when I first met him, you know, he was living in, in, in a squat in the east end of London. He was he was uh, homeless. He had been for the last 10 years. Uh, but, you know, he had things going in the sense that he was a successful maker. Mm. He was also a performance artist. Mm. And he'd been painting street art on the streets for 10 years in the dead of night trying to avoid the police. Mm. And I said to him, okay, choose one. Mm. 
and that was very difficult for him uh but he not just he didn't just choose one he chose street art obviously but if you know anything about stick's work uh, and it's easy to see some of his um he 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 a couple of years ago painted the 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 tallest mural in in the uk so it's uh 13 stories high and you can if you go on youtube you can and you google stick big mother you can um uh, you can see the the drone footage, which is quite you know nauseating actually because it's so high. <laughs> anyway, um, he decided not just that he would concentrate on street art, but that he would concentrate on a specific style. So he had a very limited color palette, mm. and he ha- he he's called Stick because he paints what would commonly be called Stick men. Mm. So um, they are six lines and a circle and two dots. That's mm. it. Mm. Um, but that is an extremely distinctive style. Mm. Right from the beginning, people were saying, okay, that stick, he paints stick men. Mm. And then comes the, and they're somehow incredibly emotionally evocative. Mm. But he uses six lines and a circle and two dots. So you see, immediately he was he was able to, he knew he needed black, he needed white, and he needed uh, one of his palette, limited palette mm. of colors. So he was able to buy in bulk. He was able to streamline his buying process. Um, you know, he was able to really uh, work within. Okay, it's going through a narrow doorway, but then there's this whole room of creativity that's to do with working within a limited range and limited palette, and kind of becoming a master in that. Ah, interesting. So, uh, yeah. So I really encourage people. I know it's so difficult because so many people who are creative have you know, multiple talents. But what do you really want to be known for? Mm. This is a crucial question to ask yourself. Because if you're a potter and a singer and a journalist and, you know, you're part time. Right. Even if you're actually spending all your days on that, each one of those directions is part time. And you're having to buy multiple types of equipment and make multiple contacts in different. So your friend who does the, the, the silk painting, I would say to her specifically, Okay, which is your favorite line to produce? Is it clothes? Is it home furnishings? What is it? Which is your most profitable line to produce? And which one is the is the most easy to to sum up and, and is the most distinctive? Mm. Now, if she's lucky, those three questions will point to the same direction. Well, she's not lucky because I think what she likes to produce is clothing. What, because the questions were, what, so let me actually ask the questions, I'll answer based on what I think. Sorry yeah. if I'm getting this wrong when you listen to the interview later, but tell me that, so what does she, so ask the question again, what does she, what does she love to produce? She loves to produce, um, she's really loving the um, fabrics, like just the idea of fabrics and the clothing, I think is probably my guess and what she would answer. What's her most profitable line? Um, probably her clothing. Okay, so that's good. So then what uh, do you think, you know, is she going to look back in 10 years and say, well, you know, I was really proud to create that? I'm not sure what's going to make her proud, but I do know that one of the impediments right now for the clothing is that there's a high learning curve because she has to get into manufacturing, which is an Mm -hmm. area that she's less familiar with and has issues with because... Um, and it's uh, providing a huge hurdle because in order to get at the price points to make it financially make it financially viable, she has to have a big lot that she produces fabrics in, and mm-hmm. that's going to cost a lot of money. And then mm-hmm. so she, and so and you know already when she's producing these lots, all these weird things happen. Like oh, this fabric you wanted was missing. So can we have the white linen versus the black linen? And you know there are all these. And with the process of manufacturing, it has those, it, that's the reality of what you're facing. So even though those two things are true, she's also facing a whole bunch of stuff that she doesn't like doing. So, uh, Well, I don't, know, I don't know if she's able to get help with that, but I mean, flipping that to the positive for a second, yeah. if she manages to overcome those technical difficulties, she will be an expert. And there will be very few people who can compete with her with what she does. That's true. That's true. She just doesn't know. It doesn't bring her joy. She, yeah. She enjoys making the art itself, but then the process of making it into a mass market product so that she can make money, she doesn't enjoy. So there's parts of it she enjoys and parts of that she doesn't. 
I don't know. Maybe maybe she needs a business partner of some kind that can help her with that stuff. Someone who has the experience, um, but also someone who enjoys doing it. Right. Yeah. Someone who enjoys that part so she can do the stuff she likes and then someone else can enjoy the stuff that they like. And that's the big thing, I guess, is the, the risk associated with all of this, right? Because if she had a lot of money, then she would go ahead and, like, pay someone. But it has to be someone. I think your idea is right. If there is someone who's a business partner who could bring in the time, energy, and willing to spend, that would be a marriage made in heaven. Yeah, I mean, I was listening to a TED talk about entrepreneurs because this is more she, – she's, if she's going for mass marketing, it's, it's, it's almost more about entrepreneurship and setting up business on that side of it, although she's obviously very creative in what she does. But this, this uh, TED talk was, was – uh, this gentleman was saying that he had never worked with a successful business where there were fewer than three partners because you have to cover the creative and the marketing – and the finances ah. and what he never met, met a single person who had all of those three things mm. covered when do you think you should pull in though so i that's very interesting and did he say or do you have a sense of you know because you have to be big enough for the partners to want to roll up their sleeves and do this work pro bono so when mm. does that generally what stage you have to be in your business for, to find those people who are like yes i'm going to roll up my sleeves i believe in you let's make it happen um, when does I that think you, happen? I, I suppose it, it depends on who you have around you. Um, I suspect that, though, that you have to demonstrate that uh, you're passionate about what you do. You're able to do it to a, a, a relatively high standard, that you have a burgeoning network and a burgeoning um, uh, audience for what you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you basically have to look serious, I think. Yeah, you have okay. to look attractive. You have to look, uh, you know, like an attractive business proposition. Right. And then I think you have to get out there and talk to the right people. I mean, if you're very creative, you're probably not uh, networking in in entrepreneur circles uh, with business people and marketers and finance people. But, you know, maybe you need to, at that point, broaden your circle a little. Uh You know, that's worth, at that stage, a little bit of investment time. And, yeah, sure, that would be boring, but but maybe. But, you know, um, at that point, that's what you need. And I think the other myth about being a creative person, particularly if you want to make a living from it, is that, you know, the public has this idea that when you're creative, you never have a down day. You never do stuff you don't want to do. Um, in fact, it's a lot like being a parent. I think you're pulled to do things that you would not otherwise consider because you care so much about what you've created. Mm-hmm. And there are down days and there are days when you then you know, oh, I hate this side of things. I just wish I could walk away. But you know that it's part of the whole package. Right. right. And that's the difference between being a professional and someone who, um, you know, writes for joy, which is fine. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you're going to make it a business, then there, there are going to be times when you're pulled to do things that you don't particularly want to do. <laughs> okay, so I want to go um, into that piece because I think uh, you actually have a, a paragraph on, or a, a section, actually several sections that are grouped together on setting up a creative career of, with, with financial constraints. So there's, mm-hmm. there's, and I've seen many different forms of this as a career coach. Um, I, I, co- I coach mostly corporate people or lawyers who really have a career. Like, I want to be, I am the head of this great big news organization, but what I really want to do is create greeting cards. Or, I, you know, I mean, they, they have what, what brings, I am like this gigantic, like a bajillion dollar per hour lawyer in New York. But what I really want to do is write news articles and, and be a reporter again. I'm like, you know, so they have these kind of creative passions, but then, there's this tension between how to, like, so I have these creative pr- passions. I may not have been pursuing them or I kind of pursue them part time. And you mentioned several different instances. Maybe you can quote some of the people who, who had these, you know, you have a real job that you need to make in order to provide for your family, provide for, you know, just food and shelter. Um, how do you do that and also decide whether your creative passions are a hobby or your next big thing well you know i think unless you have the rare situation in which you're able to work part-time on your creative stuff and it takes off uh, that does happen sometimes i think you have to make a decision about your lifestyle and if you're a big corporate lawyer in new york you know you probably have a, a social circle and a way of living that you're 
uh, and your partner probably is, you know, and your children are, uh, you know, uh, accustomed to a certain way of living. And I think you have to make a decision about um, what kind of lifestyle is important to you and how to balance that against your creative needs. It's possible that a lateral move into a more creative industry where you're picking up uh, contacts and forming a network of, and gaining experience could help. Uh, and if you're young, then that may not entail a huge dropping off of income. Mm -hmm. But it, I quote in the book um, uh, uh, Holst, who wrote The Planets, and who was also, um, I can't remember now, um, he had a full, but he had a full time job. Um, he still gave us the planets, which is something that, you know, most people can hum themes from the planets. So it doesn't mean that you necessarily aren't going to um, <clears throat> create something of worth that certainly within a, a limited circle isn't going to have, a, a, you know, a ripples of effect. Right. So, again, so again, I think that is quite a, a personal um, yeah. Well, can I mention some of the ideas that you had in the book that I absolutely love? So you talked about one of the ways that if you actually do have this um, um, challenge, right, because you have to make money and then you're also trying to balance that with your creative passions. You talk about the um, Pomodoro um, exercise and ways that you can kind of have focus, blast of creativity and I, I'm going to yeah. see if I can remember all the different tips, but one of them was, and I want to talk to you about the Pomodoro one, but one of them you said is, and that I hear from friends of mine that are writers, they said, pick the time when you're most creative or have the most energy. So my girlfriend who writes for the New York Times, she wakes up first thing in the morning and she writes for like 30 minutes, regardless of what she has to write. And maybe I don't know what to write. I don't know what to write, whatever, for 30 minutes. She just forces yeah. herself to sit down and write every single day so it's a discipline um mm -hmm. i've heard of some people you mentioned in your book find when you have the most energy to write and write and then tell us about the um pomodoro idea and and how that works or wh what yeah tell us about that um well that one is particularly useful if you're a procrastinator so mm -hmm. uh the Pomodoro method is not is not mine. It was it came, uh, someone uh, came up with it who uh, was a copywriter and, and found themselves pro procrastinating. Yeah. So what you do is, uh, and you can get apps now and and uh, programs on your computer that will help you with this. Uh, what you do is you sit yourself down and get ready to work and you set a timer. So you work in a concentrated way for uh, I think it's twenty minutes, mm -hmm. and in that time you are allowed to sip your tea and sit and do nothing and think about your project or not think about your project, but you're not allowed to surf the internet, uh, go somewhere <laughs> else, start cleaning the kitchen right. um, to, the, to a friend on the phone. You have to sit there for that 20 minutes mm. and then you get a five minute break. So it's, it's not purgatory, you know, it's only 20 minutes. You get a five minute break, you go and do anything you like. And then you set the timer again for 20, 25 minutes, whichever period, your time period you're working with. And at the end of, I think it is five periods, you get a half hour break. Okay, got it. And, um, you know, sooner or later, the subconscious mind decides, you know, this is boring. I might as well actually get on with it. I better produce something fantastic because I'm just bored with whatever is happening here. <laughs> yeah, I might as well actually apply my mind to it rather than resisting it. So that does work uh, very well. But, I, you know, I think particularly if you have other responsibilities, you need uh, at least an hour's worth of time a day or, uh, sorry, an hour's worth of time at a time mm -hmm. to let your mind percolate those ideas, to kind of let them digest. And you need to put that time aside regularly. If it's only three times a week, it's only three, three times a week. And you're not going to have written the great American novel by Wednesday. But so you need to be patient with yourself. But it is important to let your to, to remind yourself to focus, focus to focus on. So focus is is very important. There are lots of tips. Actually, there's a huge section of tips how to save time, how to focus. Yeah. How to, well, you're looking at it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So the book is set out like that. I mean, if your problem is efficiency, there's the set of tips for that. If your problem is stress, there's a set of tips for that. Right. If you have your problem is workaholism, there's a section on that. So you know, it's it's uh, it's easy to uh, to find. Yeah. So there, I'm going to read some of these just so people have you know, daydreaming is good. Play, arrange concerted focus time in order to work. What we just talked about. Feed your creative mind with books, music, images. Journal irrelevant thoughts away. Suspend your inner critic. 
Um, and I've heard that a lot, too. It's like, you know, there's a lot of like, oh, this is no good. No one's ever going to read this, you know, that kind of thing, which just. Well, actually, what I do is I, I separate myself out into two because there is, the inner critic is useful mm -hmm. when you're creating. The inner critic is useful when you're editing. With refining, yes. Refining, yeah. You might be working on a song. So when you're actually, you know, thinking about melodies and scribbling down lyrics and stuff, no critic. That's right. when the creator gets to play. A day later, when you think it's time to think, well, OK, which one of those lines is actually the chorus? Then you need your critic to come in and say, OK, that's the better line. This is the line of lyric that's killer. This this word needs to be changed. That's, you know, give the critic something to do, something specific. <laughs> Uh, and and you know schedule them in right so that you don't get the two because the two together they're going to fight you don't, uh, don't, you don't work together you just want them one day one day on one day off or however it works for you mm -hmm. but we were talking about um how difficult it is to access things uh 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 and knowledge you know and you have to pay for all these things uh i offer a free i'm about to offer a free ebook when you sign up to my mailing list oh great so if if it's it's uh, my webmaster has it, it will be up on there in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but basically, if you go to SheilaChandraCoaching.com mm -hmm. and you sign up to the mailing list, uh, then you will get. Uh, I'm putting your name so people know how yeah. to spell it. Yes. SheilaChandraCoaching.com and sign up to the mailing list. You'll get my free ebook, which is about time management for artists. Ah, perfect. It's, it takes half an hour to read. It's uh, it's very specific to artists, and um, you know it will help you with all that sort of focus and clarity about why you're doing what you're doing right all right and then um i want to go back to making money because i think that that's one of the hardest things that i hear clients talk about so um one is i'm hearing you know network and find friends and family or people to maybe not friends and family i read from your book but to try to find people that you can you know uh, be your support crew whether it's like a a, a group of other artists or business people, like you had said, I love that idea too. Um, so then you talk about diversifying as another thing. Um, and you talk about, um, and, and I was mentioning my, my own uh, friend who is a writer has workshops. And so what are some other ways that people who are artists can actually find other ways that don't feel repulsive to them because I <laughs> right because I have like my friends who are like oh I have to do this awful job so I can make money and that and it drains me of energy and then I can't do the thing I love doing because I have to do the thing I hate doing to make money yeah. so what are ways to diversify your business well that's really advice to someone who's able to uh, be almost full-time or to set up who's had a lot of interest with what they do so they've got their brand together they're known for a specific thing um when i say diversify as i said before it's no good going in lots of directions so that yes. your brand is kind of lost right. um with um stick for instance he uh he started in street art so his gallery was the street uh eventually he started um he, and uh, social media helped him a lot with that because people were taking pictures of his work, selfies and things, and posting them all over social media. <clears throat> Eventually, he started selling, uh, painting and selling direct to private clients and also exhibiting within galleries. But then he diversified into sculpture. Uh, he also does. He also used to do uh, workshops with uh, children. He did uh, so. He'd go into schools. And he'd paint his basic stick figures and they'd paint hats and, you know, oh, scarves sweet. and, you know, kind of dress them up. And he's done some beautiful, uh, he did a, like a, 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 I think, 50 or 100 figure long mural where he had all these children painting mm -hmm. on the South Bank just by the Thames. Um, uh, what else? So, uh, yeah, obviously his client base that are into his paintings are also likely to buy his uh, scarves. Okay, so, I'm, so here's and what. You want the kind of diversification where you can set up a sort of sister streams of income where you're still doing what you basically love, but you're finding other ways to reach a market with your specific brand. Mm. So, um, you know, stick figure sculptures obviously are still very much what he does and still very creative. It's not like him going out and, and, and getting a job in a local shop. Um but he's able to sell to a slightly different audience. And then when he when he works with institutions and he's doing workshops, obviously that's a slightly different uh, thing as well. But it's it's the same basic mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. uh, impulse that he's using and it's still part of his brand mm, okay so it sticks s-t-i-x and is that the name s-t-i-k and is that the name of someone would ask a listener would ask if that's the name of the book is that also the name of his book uh he has a book called stick yes okay. um s-t-i-k book, yeah yeah Okay, so they're, they're, these are ways. So I misunderstood when I first read this. So, um, and, and what I thought when you're when you're telling me about stick, I, I get the concept. When you are actually a big, you know, your brand is becoming very defined and clear. So he had a color palette. He had a visual image that was very, you know, the stick figure. Yeah, the signature style. Yeah. 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 So once that becomes very very clear, then go and diversify and find other kind of revenue streams that you can build off of your business so i think about martha stewart right so she has a whole pastel thing going on she has a whole her, her brand represents like beautifully presented but simple beautiful kind of everything whether it's you know dining room table or bedroom whatever like cooking like she has that whole kind of and then she diversified into magazine and tv show and and this she's that's it's probably an ancient example i'm sure there are other ones that are more modern but but that kind of thing or oprah same thing yeah i mean she didn't go and start selling motorbikes she didn't she didn't do something totally outside what you associate her with right so for instance i'm a singer um well obviously there's recordings um and i can make money doing gigs those are the two obvious ones but i could sell band merchandise Mm. at the gigs Mm-hmm. Um, I could uh, give workshops. Um, so uh, I could teach at the local college. You know, I could teach music students. There are all sorts of, if you're a journalist and you have a specialist subject, you could run workshops on that subject. So let's say you you're, you're a, uh, came across a journalist about four or five years ago whose, whose specialist subject was financial planning. So the kinds of articles she sold to specialist magazines were all about financial uh, planning. And, um, you know, um, obviously she could teach classes on that subject and then she was dependent on editors and, and sort of ebb and flow of whether she was commissioned or not. So it's I think having three income, diverse income streams uh, when you're full time is extremely useful because, you know, in the summer, maybe you'll play a lot of gigs, a lot of festivals. What are you going to do in the winter? Right. Right. Yeah. So, so it's almost even, thinking about, right. yeah, to even out. The flow of stuff. So I have a friend who is a Emmy producing news reporter, and he does so he ha- he does exactly like you mentioned. He has a class that he teaches every single year, and it's during a certain time. I think it's during the winter. So he has that that he teaches. He also works um, doing broadcasting um, journalism. Uh, he runs the in the local college here or not so local the university here he runs the broadcasting station so he's the head producer of that so that's kind of an ongoing income stream that he can depend on throughout the whole year then he has little infusions of teaching this one class in florida for journalists and then he and has then the news and then because you know he'll have got all those diverse income streams based on the back of his reputation yes which is the back of a very clear brand yes yes this his, guy yeah. is good at thing yeah we know we use him to plug this gap so that's why we'll hire him right yeah and he has a very like you said he has a very distinctive brand he tells a story in a very specific way where there's kind of uh you know you tell the story and it has a a twisting twisted end at the end that surprises and delights and so he (laughs) teaches about his way of storytelling and and it's it's interesting just hearing all the different um, ways, but I think that that is true when you're full time. I think you're right. Three seems to be. Uh, he has about three, and when I really think about it, I do think a friend of mine who used to write for the New Yorker, or write, writes for the New Yorker, or writes for her book, you know, teaches wor- workshops. It's like similar kind of thing. Okay, yeah. so that's talking about diversifying, um, and then I think we talked about network. I want to talk about in. Um, uh, some other things related to money because these seem to be the big thing that that people seem you know when you decide to pursue a path like this so how do you and, and you had such because it's so encyclopedic I'm, i feel like i'm going all over the place so i just try to focus on the money piece well this um, is the trouble with having a 40-year arts career in various <laughs> guises i started as a child actress 
and then I, I was a world musician. I had a hit. Then I, I moved uh, to more specialist stuff with, without singles and uh, albums on Peter Gabriel's Real World label. And then I had problems with my voice. And then I became an author and, you know, and now the creative career coaching. So, you know, it, yeah, you can't fit it all in. <laughs> Not in my book. <laughs> I need to write another one. <laughs> I know. How do you fit it all in? How do you fit all this stuff in? All right. So how do you, so the other question that I have, so I literally talked to this one woman who was very creative and she was taught. So this is a, these are examples of clients that I have who said, I think I need to get it. I need to go into a traditional career. And I was like, what happened? And she said, well, I was an artist. I didn't put enough money in for my nest egg. Like, and all my brothers and sisters are lawyers and doctors. And I feel like I made a colossal mistake because it's now in my retirement and I have no money. And I also don't have any discernible skills that I can actually translate into like a money making scenario. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know what to tell her. I mean, I didn't have any really good advice. What, do, what advice do you have for people who, you know, they have like real things, college education, retirement, how do you, and I, you have a really novel idea in there about splitting your bank account in different ways, but what, what ideas do you have or that you have found are important for people who need to take care of themselves? Um, I think this is where looking, uh, having either someone who helps you with the money side of things or, or being quite realistic about what you're able to afford. I've known people who have had, uh, you know, careers as uh, professionals who then um, thought, I want to be an artist when they reached 40 and kind of blown their nest egg in a year because oh, wow. have a career plan. Um, it's one thing, the creative side of things, and that's totally laudable. But if you are going to put your financial life on the line, I think you have to be very clear right from the beginning and approach it as a business and say, how am I actually going to fulfill my personal needs? Mm -hmm. What is realistic? Uh, what is the market grabbing onto in terms of what I produce? Uh, which direction should I be focusing on? And, you know, you give it, I think you give it, a limited amount of time you give it your best shot and if it's not working then I think you really do have to step back and say um, okay now I do have to take care of myself and that's very difficult to do because you know uh, I think for creative people it's a vocation it's a kind of madness yeah and it's very difficult uh, it's very difficult to step back like that but you know professional uh, creative people are business people too mm you don't have that business edge and the ability to step back and assess then uh a you won't run your business properly but b you know you won't you won't be taking care of yourself yeah so i i can't answer specifically for your friend because I'd, I'd have to sort of uh know a lot more but you know yeah um, First thing is that she needs to take care of herself, obviously. Yeah. She, she needs to make sure. Well, what I liked in your book, so for example, if, if I were to, uh, when I've coached people in this regard, I've said, okay, so there's, there's a financial planner who will sit down. Financial planners are people who put together financial plans and say, you need to make X amount or have this amount of money in your nest egg. So when you get retired, you're, you're retired, you do not carve, like do not touch. And I love, you have something in the book like this where it's like this kind of do not touch money. You do not touch this nest egg that's golden. And then you have like maybe a, a certain percentage. It's like, this is what I need. And I think in your book, you said six to 12 months of kind of run, uh, uh, run rate so you know, I have to pay my car insurance I have to pay my taxes yeah so you do a whole budget pay. for your year and yeah. you include Christmas and you include birthdays and all those one-off things that you pay and uh, obviously you shop around and make sure you get the best deal on everything but at the end of the day you come up with a yearly tally and you break it down into months and you you because we often get paid you know I, I get uh, record royalties for instance or book royalties I get once every six months now if I run out and buy a Ferrari that's really not going to be very good <laughs> so I have to have a, 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 a living kind of pot of money in, a, in a, an account and then I have a day-to-day -day running account so every month I pay myself mm. my monthly budget and you know if I haven't exceeded my monthly budget then I'll go and buy that perfume or go and buy whatever it is uh, that in right want. But it's like sort of when you, you know you've got the money, but it's sort of like when you set your watch five minutes fast, you kind of know when you're coming up to the limit 
Mm. And you think, oh, yeah, okay, I'll pull back a little bit this month. And maybe I'll do that next month. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not, it's so tempting otherwise, you know, you get in a few thousand and you think, okay, great, holiday, you know, party, right. whatever. Um, and, and it's really important to kind of keep those, uh, that money separate and do your budget and know what you need to, to survive on a, on a monthly. Uh, okay. I get that. So now. The whole, okay. That that whole system is, is sort of, um, outlined. Yeah. There. I love that idea. And then what do you do for, so the, I've had, um, a dear friend who, um, was told go big or go home, you know, and, and there's this kind of thing where you reach a point in your business that there's a cash infusion that you need in order to grow it to the next level. So in the example of my uh, designer friend, it was I need to actually grow it to this so I can get the create the lot that makes it financially viable for me to print out my stuff. Um, uh -huh. It could be I need to actually invest in a video platform in order to go and like present my coaching online. You know, there's a there's like some big cash infusion that you need. And sometimes it can be, you know, 10, 15 grand that you're having to decide on whether to invest. And so I've had some friends that go into debt and they go into debt and then like they're in the hole and they may have actually tucked in some of their nest eggs. I mean, how do you how do you what are you what are your thoughts of this go home or go big idea? I'm not sure that slogans are really that useful. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it really works like that. You know, the phrase, like the phrase overnight success is usually means you've been beavering away for like 15 years <laughs> and there you have your overnight success. Uh, you know, actual overnight success is, is pretty rare. Um, I think that, yes, you do need to invest. There's a point at which you will not get any further unless you invest. But there are also usually a heck of a lot of small steps you can take, which will enable to you to discover whether that investment is likely to pay dividends. Mm. I would, I mean, we, if you want to be a singer, for instance, I wouldn't say uh, go out and make an expensive recording. You're 16, you want, you left school, you want to be a singer, go out and spend, blow 10 grand on a single. You know, that's really not the way to do it. The way to do it is to, you know, sing with a band or get some session work or, um, you know, go and find out who your audience is and what they want, develop your style. Uh, get a sense of how many people are uh, willing to buy your stuff and are behind you and how much you're likely to earn. And this can be the kind of thing it's useful to discuss with a, mm. not with a, with a traditional paid for financial advisor, but someone who understands money and investment and taking a risk within business. Because it's always that. Corporations have the same thing. When, when do they spend a lot of money on the next bit of R&D? When do they keep selling what they've got? Right. It's it, you. What, the question you're asking is not really a creative person's dilemma in the sense that it's a dilemma that anybody who's self-employed or has their own business has to face. Right. Yeah. So I think so. If you were in a corporation, I can tell you the answer is you actually have had to put together a business plan, which you also talk about in the book, which is you know what are your business plans? What's the demographics? What's the market situation? You know. And actually, I was talking to someone about this that I thought they said, go out and get a bank loan. If you can't get a bank loan, then you're probably don't have a viable enough business to actually be able to. If, 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 if a business person listens to your scenario and says, I don't there's not enough information in here or I don't know, you probably haven't done enough due diligence before you pick your nest egg of 10 grand and give it away like do the due diligence to give it to a, ba a bank or, or someone, you know what I mean? Like someone who's truly an investor and they'll tell you, like, yeah, you don't have I enough information. <laughs> the only caveat with that is that when you're talking about um, creative pro projects, there's a lot, there's a big bias against creative projects ah, and they're okay. far riskier. So going to a traditional investor, investor or a traditional bank may not give you uh, that kind of information. Ah, okay. That, well, who, who would you go to that would be like someone who kind of is going to look at it with the business lens and go? Sorry. Well, you know, if you if you are that singer and you want to make a recording, uh, go to a record company and see if they're willing to sign you. Would they put their money behind you? Right. Yeah. Okay. Would the manager put some money into developing you. If yeah. not, then you need to get yourself into a situation where you do have that kind of sway, and you do that by building your profile and by building your fan base. Yeah. If you haven't and that groundwork there and people in the right sorts of investment 
niches aren't willing to invest in you, then you have a you have a telltale sign there that you haven't done enough. Well, here's I'm just going to use a great example. This book, right? You you actually wrote an ebook that you gave to Sticks, and this is the and then you actually added to it, which to create this book, right? I mean, it wasn't as if you just like, I'm going to write a great book. Like you wrote a book, there were people interested in, and now it's this fantastic book. And people were asking, is this all in the book? I got three questions. Is this all in the book? Yes, it is all in the book. Organizing for creative people. Um, yeah, so there, are, there are 10 chapters. And, and it starts with, because I my previous book was a, a bestseller. And that was a book on home organizing. So I and I don't I think it's a very political point that you you shouldn't as an artist, you cannot separate out your home and your work life the way a factory boss can with a worker. You are not replaceable. So the book, it's built on chapters that are sequential. You actually start with some very basic organizing of your work spaces, your studio, whatever it is, uh, to make it the most possible efficient. Uh, way to run and then you do that with your home life and then you do that with your office and then you get onto the head stuff you on the stuff like social media and promotion yes and here's the title of the book your your website because we I've, i'm beginning time time <laughs> i could talk to you forever so we've been talking to sheila chandra and you can go to her website and uh, get her information any other quick piece of information my the engineer is going to kill me I send people by skype a video all over the world so if you want a free 30 minute consultation with me and we talk about what your creative career problems are go to sheila chandra and uh get in touch Thank you so much. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.